Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Purdy Insurance. Visit Purdy Insurance on Market Street in Sunbury or visit online at purdyinsurance.com. Sports talk where your voice counts. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. Today's show brought to you by Purdy Insurance. Market Street and Sunbury. Go to purdyinsurance.com. No, they do not have anti rant insurance. But nobody else does either. We just have to all sit there and tolerate it. Auto home life business. RV, boat, motorcycle, whatever it may be, they'll do everything they can they can to make you fully insured and save you money. Great people. All of Purdy Insurance, Market Street in Sunbury versus Purdy. We're in the Sunbury Motors studio. Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors, Kia, routes 11 and 15, home of Wharf Online. And Sunbury Motors. Time now for our play-by-play call of the day. The Knights, who couldn't beat Merrimack, couldn't beat Hartford, but somehow beat Purdue. The lob, and that will do it. the second time ever a 16 beats a one that is Andrew Catalan with the call on CBS on Friday night there was a point where it looked like Purdue was starting to take a little control midway through the half Zach Eady literally attempted no shots in the final nine minutes wow John Sauber now joins us from the Center of the LA Times. John, always a pleasure. It's been, it was great to see you in Chicago. It was great to see you in Des Moines. Yeah, it's great seeing you, you too, Steve. I'm, uh, I'm kind of glad to be sleeping in my bed. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah, I, kinda, I, I have the attitude of, oh, I wish I was preparing for one more game. But, <laughs> yeah, I listen, I would have loved to cover the Sweet 16, but there is, this is a nice uh, second prize of getting to be home for more than 26 hours. Yes. Uh, your thoughts on what you did witness, especially over the last month? Yeah, I I came away from this. I, I talked to a lot of people, you know, around the program, a lot of people that cover the team and everything like that. Uh, and you know, the, the general consensus is that I think that it was pretty clearly a, this was at least a top twenty-five team in the country, um, and they ran into a team that matched up well with them uh, in Texas. That is also a top, you know, five to seven team country right like this is mm-hmm. uh, i don't think there was a single team left in that ncaa tournament that i looked at and thought penn state couldn't have uh beaten quite frankly and i think that's a testament to the coaching uh to the players to the to the way they play and, and you know the shots they were making down the stretch uh it took you know them having one of their worst shooting performances of the season uh to lose to texas and and mind you i, I don't think this was you know a bad shot profile night either right where these were all contested looks they were getting open looks and they just kind of weren't falling and and that happens sometimes, but I, you know, I think they that Penn State ended the year as, as one of the best teams in the country. All right, Michael Shrewsbury, uh, a year ago, looked at his team and said, "Look, they need to play defense. Simple as that. And you know, play defense, run the clock, the whole deal, based on the personnel he had. Personnel he had with this team, with this team." He looked at it and said, you know what, three-pointers, wide open, here we go, let's play. Uh, what does that tell us about a coach and his ability to adapt based to personnel? Yeah, I think it says everything about Micah, right, how good of a coach he is. Uh, I think the goals are always going to be the same with this team, that on defense they want to they wanna funnel you to certain shot types, right, that they, they want you to take 18-footers, they... They don't want you to get open threes. They don't want you to get shots at the rim. And on offense, they're they're going to try to get to the rim. They're always going to try and shoot threes. But 
you know, that will vary, like you said, depending on the personnel that you have. I think the pace will adjust depending on the personnel that you have. Um, you know, they, they took care of the ball a ton this year. They did that last year, too, but I think that's Jalen Pickett based more than anything, right, knowing that you can have him at the controls of the offense. But it shows that, that Micah can kind of adapt in these situations, that he's been able to adapt to the, the talent he has, to the, uh, the weapons at his disposal. I do think this year is closer to the idealized version of what he wants the, the team and the program to look like, right, especially offensively. Uh, you want to play four out. Uh, five out is more ideal, obviously, but at least four out and, you know, have someone that can pass the ball, uh, you know, as a big man. And, and frankly, Jalen Pickett operated as that big man. I think Keba Jai will be that in the future as someone that is a, a really good passer for, for a big. Uh, but, yeah, I think there's there's a lot of adaptability and a lot of willingness to basically, you know, you he, he got, tries to go out and get the guys that he needs, but whatever he has in the end, he's going to try and make it work uh, as well as he can with those guys. You mentioned Kevin Jai and answer. Over the last month, how much better did he get? He was phenomenal. Uh, I, I think, like, Texas, I don't want to call it a setback. It wasn't his best game. That was always going to be a tough matchup for him. But mentally, he's, he's such a different player uh, now than he was in November. Uh, I actually, you know, I asked him about that. I think it was Wednesday out in Des Moines when we had the open locker room. And one of the things he said was, you know, prior to... Uh, you know, sort of feeling comfortable at the beginning of the year, especially, he would feel like butterflies in his stomach and his knees would be shaky. Like, he was really genuinely nervous. And I think that also puts in good perspective that he is very much a kid still, right? Like, uh, he's 18 uh, and doesn't turn 19, I think, till August. But he is still learning uh, and still adjusting. But he said that that's just not a thing anymore. And I asked him after the A&M game, and he said, no, I wasn't nervous at all. Like, you would think that maybe playing the NCAA tournament would, would kind of revert him back to maybe some of the nerves and some of the, the cautiousness, but that wasn't the case. It was, it was you know, abundantly clear on the court, too, but it's good to hear him reaffirm that, too, that this was, you know, not the case. So I think he just got comfortable, uh, and he had to adjust to adding a lot of strength in the offseason, something he did before he even got to campus. Uh, he was so adjusting to that. He's still adjusting to college life. He's still adjusting to dealing with uh, Big Ten bigs, and you know, I think it all came together for him in a, in a really positive way, and I think it's, it's, you know, it's indicative of what he can be in the future. Did this run by Penn State, where they won nine of their last 12, and seven of the wins were over NCAA tournament field teams, beat Illinois twice, beat Northwestern twice, beat Maryland, beat Indiana, beat Texas A&M, does this show what Penn State basketball can be? Yeah, and I, honestly, I, I think it can be more. Uh, I think uh, basketball, especially with the state of the transfer portal, is a sport where you can kind of just decide to be good, right? And if you invest in the program and you put the resources into it and, uh, you know, and, and try and back it, I, I think that this program, there's no reason it can't be, uh, I know Wisconsin hasn't been as good lately, but a Wisconsin-type program where you routinely make an NCAA tournament, routinely in the top half of the Big Ten, uh, routinely competing for a legitimate, you know, Sweet 16, Final Fours, the Eights, what have you. Uh, I mean, it's really difficult to get there. We, we see it year in and year out. There's rarely any consistent, consistency anymore because it is so hard to, to be one of the last eight to 16 teams in the country. But I think with the proper investment in the program, I, I don't think there's a reason to believe that they can't take the next step, right? We, we see it all the time. It's not like, you know, basketball programs are in, in hotbeds where it's like you, you have to be recruiting to these areas and like, you know, with football, it's generally the case you'll see a lot of teams in the South succeed more and have a little bit easier transition to get to the point that the higher-end programs do because they have the talent pool. That's just not the case in basketball. Uh, good players, any... There's no reason to believe that, especially with Michael Shrewsbury as the head coach, that this team can't be a consistent, a consistent NCAA tournament for us. And that's what you need at this point, obviously, to be a consistent threat. Uh, and that's where the transfer portal comes in. The transfer portal was important how they plugged it with the Cam winner and Andrew Funk. Uh, Mikey Hen came in with this particular group. And it made a big difference to go with Jalen Pippen. Uh, so you look at the current uh, you look at the current roster makeup as to who's coming and going. And, and we'll have to wait and see on Seth one again. You know, like I said, I, my advice is quite simple. Check out all the evaluations from the NBA you can and see what they say. Uh, because you want what's best for Seth. 
So how do you look at this makeup and what could what would Penn State need in the transfer portal in your opinion? Yeah, I think I think the first thing is, is a primary ball handler to to replace Pickett. Um, I think there is you know there's enough reason to believe that Evan Mahaffey can take on some of that role next year, that Kanye Clary can take on some of that role. Uh, but I still think there are more secondary guys with controlling the ball at this point. Uh, I, I think you want to go find someone that can control the offense, that can be your leading scorer, that can be your best distributor, um, that can attack the rim, that can score at all three levels. And I know that sounds like a National Player of the Year candidate, uh, and it probably is. But you know, yes. some level of that, uh, of that type of player that can come in and help out right away. Uh, I think, you know, depending on what happens with Lundy, I think getting some wings in to help. Uh, would be big because you need guys that can guard. Uh, you know, Kev Bajai is, is uh, you know, a good starting five. I don't know that they ever want to be a, a massive team, you know, that's going to be feeding the post or anything like that. Uh, so I think getting some size on the wing will really help. Uh, I think they have some internal options to replace some of the shooting, right? Like I think a lot of what uh, Andrew Funk did, you know, it'll be different. It'll look a lot different, but I think Jameel Brown can replace some of that because he's an excellent shooter. He uh, can shoot off the dribble, create for himself and get to the rim. Uh, so I think some of that might be internal, but and I know a lot of people have been talking about the need for a big man. I don't, I just don't think it's as pressing uh, because I think Keba is going to eat up a lot of the minutes, even if it's 20 to 24. Uh, then you talk about filling 16 to 20. Maybe you know you, you find another wing that you can play at the five and play small again. That eats up eight of those minutes, and then suddenly you're talking about bringing in a guy to play 12 minutes. And you know who's to say that Demetrius Lilly can't just eat up that time, right? So. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't mind if Penn State went and got a big. I think it has to be someone that's good and someone that's really going to contribute to make it worth it. I think there are those kind of guys out there, and they're targeting some right now. But you know, I think I would prioritize the ball handling, the shooting, and and the size on the wing more than anything else at this point. Yeah. What do you think Michael Shrewsbury's NBA background means, and then what does this past season mean in practical application to match that? Yeah, I think it, it goes back to what I said about the, the efficiency stuff, right? Like the, uh, you know, teams in the NBA just play more modern basketball than most college teams at this point, right? And uh, they develop players kind of with that in mind. They, they focus on, you know, getting guys that are skilled. It's not necessarily about always about floor spacing. It's about guys who can do more than one thing, right? Like you aren't finding many specialized guys uh, as much in the NBA. And I think you'll see uh, Mike and teams, that'll be a feature. I've talked about a lot, like, Andrew Funk, uh, he'll get a lot of credit for being an elite shooter because he is one, but he can also attack closeouts. He can attack off the dribble. He can finish at the rim because he had the ball in his hands so much uh, at Bucknell. Uh, so I think it, it's going to lead to essentially a roster construction that always looks like that, where there isn't just, a, oh, this guy only shoots, or, oh, this guy only defends, or this guy is only you know a, a creative passer. There will be a bunch of guys that, uh, that can do everything, and I think this roster is a good indication of that, right? Like, Cam Winner could find his spots on the floor, but he was also a good passer, and he was competitive defensively, even if he didn't have great size. Uh, Funk, I already mentioned, you know, what he did. Pickett was good on both ends of the court. and could do everything offensively. Uh, you know, the, the freshman coming in, Logan Himes is, is a multifaceted player on offense, uh, can can kind of do everything. Brayden Shrewsbury, of course, is an excellent shooter, but we're seeing that he can create a little bit of the dribble, too, and Gary Booth, same way. So I think you're seeing that, you know, it's all of these guys that have multiple skills, uh, they're not isolated to doing one thing, and that's the only thing that they do well. And I, I think that really adds a layer of dimension to the offense and, and frankly, to the defense where guys can, can guard on and off the ball well. Uh, I'm not surprised, to be honest with you, about the, the Big Ten. I mean, look, only Penn State and Michigan State, they're the only two that exceeded their seeds in, in the tournament. And to be honest with you, John, I wasn't surprised. I, I sort of was expecting this. Because right? I've, I've been saying for, geez, Matt knows, maybe a month and a half been saying that Purdue was not going to get out of the weekend. Well, they, you know, they didn't even get out of Friday. But yeah. I'm saying, I'm, real, I'm not really surprised by it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I am either, honestly. And I think, and I think some people may think I'm crazy for saying this, but I honestly thought Penn State was the team most well-equipped to make a run because of the way they play. Uh, yes. The Big Ten has it, it, the pace is slow, which Penn State's slow too. But they they aren't slow with you know they're oh they're going to post ups and they're you know the guys backing someone down for four minutes. They do it with Pickett, but Pickett is making quick decisions off that right. He's getting to a post up, and then he's either getting a shot quickly or he's making a quick decision to spray the ball around and and get those high efficiency looks. But you're right, like this is it's a conference that's not 
built for modern college basketball in a lot of ways, right? Like there's no so plotting yeah, right. and it's it, and it's it, you know the, the the physicality I think that teams get away with, then they they show up in March and suddenly everyone's in foul trouble, right? Like I, you know I I think that there there needs to be a shift more toward the way that. Uh, you know, other coaches and other conferences coach, I think Shrewsbury's brought that in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, I think Matt Painter's teams are kind of a good example of that. They just, you know, this year, I think because they're so ED-centric, like, it's essentially him and everyone else on that team, and they were always kind of destined to, to fall off soon, like you said, because of that. But, you know, he also plays in a way that I think can be more conducive to March. It just kind of hasn't worked out for one reason or another at different times. Right. Uh, but I think that's the style of play that, that coaches kind of have to pivot to. Ohio State, actually, I think was a good example of this, that, you know, had they somehow won to beat that yeah. tournament, I they could have made some noise in March because, like, they play that way, too. They're trying to uh, push the pace. They're trying to hunt efficient shots and, and, you know, be competitive defensively. Well, notice what Michigan State has done in the tournament. Michigan exactly. State has pushed the pace much more because now the floor is more wide open than it was during the Big Ten season. And Dick Girardi came up with a good one, and he comes up with a lot of good ones, but this was a few. He said, Michael Shrewsbury is the Big Ten basketball, what Joe Tiller was the Big Ten football. Yes, exactly. And it, 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 you know, it, the parallels are really evident, too, even with the spacing aspect, right? Because... Uh, yep. we, we're learning more and more in sports in general that the more space guys that have to operate, the better they are, especially when it comes to, you know, in basketball guys with the ball in their hands, uh, and in football with, you know, guys with the ball in their hands, but receivers and skill position players. Uh, I think that's a great comparison, right? Like, it's, it's all about spacing on offense and getting your guys opportunities to make things happen and use their talent, use their abilities, um, rather than trying to operate in a phone booth, uh, you know, and I think that, you know, it's... It, Big Ten basketball needs to trend in that direction like Big Ten football has, and we're seeing there's a reason that, you know, Ohio State and Penn State are two, usually two of the better offenses in the Big Ten and football because they, they, you know, spread everything out and let guys go to work, and, you know, it impacts the running game and the passing game in football. It impacts everything in basketball. Um, but, yeah, I think, you know, that is that is where this needs to go. Otherwise, the conference is going to eventually fall behind. And if it, it hasn't already, I mean, I... It, it makes for an incredibly competitive regular season. There's no no question about that. Absolutely. And the games are close, and you know, and and everything comes down to the wire. And Penn State played, according to Ken Palm, the 17th toughest schedule in the country this year. Now, and that's obviously with all the groupings and teams that they played along the way. But but then you get to the NCAA tournament. The game is not played in a phone booth. And DeSue played terrific, but he did not play the same way as the bigs in the Big Ten play. Right. And and I think the other thing is uh, the, the example of sort of why it goes wrong is that Indiana team that we saw last night uh, yes. against Miami. Uh, they take way too many long twos, right? Like they're It seems like they're encouraged to pass up open threes and take long twos, and so they're already losing the efficiency battle. And so then you're kind of just relying on Trace Jackson Davis to carry the team, and and he, he almost did uh, last night before it kind of got out of hand late. But, yeah, you're relying on – you're putting too much on guys uh, on an individual basis to get everything done. And, it, you know, it it, uh, it, it mucks up the game and kind of spalls everything out offensively. Uh, but, yeah, I, you know, I, this is uh, – you're right, the competitiveness in the regular season is nice. I don't think it sets the conference well up, though, in the postseason. And to like – for as good as he was, too, the, he, you know, he, he kind of took the shots that Penn State wanted him to take. And listen, if sometimes mm -hmm. a guy's going to make a 10- to 15-foot push shot over and over again, yes. you just live with the result. But like you said, that kind of athleticism, that, that ability to get into those spaces as a big is not something the team is used to seeing. Um, I think they prepared well for it and they handled it the right way. But it's still like, you know, it, it says something about the coaching staff and how good they are that they were that ready after not facing something uh, you know, that kind of strategy all season, not seeing that kind of player pretty much all season. John, great work. It was great to see you out at both Chicago and Des Moines. You did some great work all around it, so congratulations on that. Yeah, thank you, Steve. I really appreciate that. I had a lot of fun out there, and I really enjoyed seeing you out there as well. Appreciate it, John. We'll talk uh, shortly because there's a lot of football and draft to talk about, too. That's right. We're already here. It's already here, and the Friday is Pro Day, so there we go. And, and I can assure you, in no uncertain terms, Sauber and Jones are not running 40s. <laughs> <laughs> I might, I might not are, be able to walk a 40 at this point. We are observers. 
<laughs> veteran observer. That's right. Thanks, John. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate it. You, you bet. All right. Do you have any other rants before we continue? I just want to prepare myself for the final half hour. <laughs> I do, which which one, I was waiting to see how much you would talk about this today, but I kind of, I'm going to take what John said a step further about the Big Ten. I think they hit rock bottom. I think Big Ten play in basketball hit rock bottom this weekend, led by Purdue moving to FDU, but this, this style of play was completely exposed in everybody else. Everybody else is gone. You have one team left. Of nine yeah. that but, that but, brought in. But That's Matt, embarrassing. Matt, whatever. Matt, what? No, it's not embarrassing. Please. Uh, first of all, okay. Five teams got to the second round. So you went five and three in the first round, and one team got to the, the Sweet Sixteen. What have I been saying for two months? What have I been saying on the show for two months? That the Big Ten was not going to get a lot of advantages in the NCAA tournament. Oh, yeah. I, I, that's what I've I'm been saying. I've been saying that yeah. over and over again. So it's not like, hey, but, but let's, because the best conference this year is the Big 12. No question. All right. So now let's look at what we have on the balance sheet. You know who's doing well? The Big East. Yeah, and the SEC. And the, right? SEC to a point. The number two team in the SEC got knocked out sure. by Penn State. Texas A&M lost to Penn State. Right? Kentucky got knocked out. You've got Alabama, the number one seed. And they're the number one overall seed in the tournament. They played great. You've got Tennessee, which to be honest with you, Tennessee is a team that is, they're one of those teams, that, they're not fun to watch. I'm surprised they I made it this far, to be honest with you. Well, they've got skill, but they played great defense. They play great defense. Right? And I don't know if there's anybody else in that conference that did it. Uh, Arkansas. Arkansas, obviously, I saw Arkansas. It's three. So they've got three in. And Arkansas beat Kansas. So now you go to the Big 12. Baylor lost. Right? Kansas lost. Iowa State lost. They lost in the first round. I mean, you start going through all these conferences. You know, the Pac-12 only has UCLA left. Big Ten has Michigan State left. Right? But Gonzaga's from the WCC, they're in. Ford Atlantic's in. I mean, let's face it, luck of the draw. I mean, they ended up with FDU in the second round. The so Conference USA has a team. Houston made it for number one seed. Well, they're from the American. And you've got people from all over the place here. College basketball has become a sport that has so much parity in it that Penn State, the quote 10 seed, you know what the difference between Penn State and Texas is? I'm holding my fingers about a quarter inch apart that much. That's the difference. I mean, Duke's out. Okay, twice this century, 21st century, Duke, North Carolina, Kansas, and Kentucky are not in the Sweet 16. The other time was 2021. See, the transfer portal has tightened up the sport dramatically, Matt. Oh, yeah, that's that definitely without, without a doubt. And the style of play that the Big Ten plays, I tell you right now, the SEC has a style of play, and I'm telling you, okay, after watching Texas A&M, they play the same way as everybody else. They're beatable. Mm-hmm. When car repairs get difficult. Well, I, I just don't know. Um, me neither. We get good. Sunbury Motors. 
more than quality new and used cars. Sunbury Motors specializes in complicated auto repair diagnosis. They can handle intricate repairs and even complete auto body with service open Monday through Friday, 7 till 4. And Sunbury Motors has made simple repairs easy. Maintaining your vehicle is necessary. Finding the time to do it is difficult. Welcome to Sunbury Motors Quick Lane. Open 7 till 4, Monday through Friday. Just walk in or call ahead. Relax in their remodeled waiting room with Wi-Fi, beverages, and snacks. Will Sunbury Motors factory train techs take care of your oil change, tire alignments, brakes, and inspections? Quick Lane, 6.30 to 6, Monday through Friday, Saturday, 6.30 till 2. Sunbury Motors, Ford and Hyundai, North 4th Street, Sunbury. And Sunbury Motors, Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. We take the... Mm -hmm. Out of auto repair. Sports talk where your voice counts. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. Today's show brought to you by Purdy Insurance, Market Street in Sunbury. Go to purdyinsurance.com. Auto, home, life, business, motorcycle, boat, RV. You'll be fully insured. They'll get you the best coverage. They'll get you the best price. They'll do everything they can to save you money. Could be bundles over state lines where you're allowed. Go with Purdy Insurance, Market Street in Sunbury. Go to purdyinsurance.com. We're in the Sunbury Motors studio. Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors, Kiel, Routes 11 and 15, home of Fork and online at sunburymotors.com. You were talking about how the Big Ten only got one through this week 16. Matt, a lot of this is always about matchups. It's not just the generalization of who got there. What was your matchup? Uh, you know, and you know, let's take an SEC team that didn't get there. Missouri. Missouri beat Utah State and then lost to Princeton. Okay? Baylor, Big 12 team, lost to Creighton. Creighton's on a pretty good run. Uh, you know, it, everything is always about matchup. What are your matchups? Illinois at Arkansas hated the matchup for Illinois. Just didn't like it. Penn State at Texas A&M. Quietly, I really like it. Right. Um, Purdue, of course, the, the Purdue at the U thing, you can't do that. Anymore. That's just something. But I did not like what their second round matchup was going to be, whether it was Florida Atlantic or whether it was or it was Memphis. I didn't like the second round. Um, Northwestern got around, so they uh, Northwestern, by the way, met its seed. They won their first round. There were seven. They met their seed. They just they couldn't beat UCLA. That's not a great matchup for them. Right? Just like Penn State as a ten, right? The matchup wasn't bad. Gasu has just had, has been on a roll and he's played great basketball. Right? But it's always about matchups. Who do you match up with? And this is the deal all the time. I like Maryland's matchup with West Virginia. They met their seed. The second round, they got Alabama. So what were they supposed to do? I and mean, what were they supposed to do? I mean, you're going through and and, and taking a look at how everybody got to the point that they're in right now. And it's to me, it's always about who do you match up with? And that's a big part of this. In Indiana at Miami. Honestly, Matt, I thought Miami, because of how athletic they are and what they do in the perimeter, I didn't like that for Indiana at all. I thought Indiana could beat Drake, or excuse me, could beat Kent State. I really thought that. That was not an issue in my head. Well, I guess but my you, I guess my point is it, it's why were they bad matches? It's because of the way Big Ten plays. I, no, it's, it's more. I, I didn't expect I, I, everything you said. I, mean, I, I totally expected. I expected everybody to lose those matches that you mentioned. But again, the Big Ten only had two teams in the top four seeds. They only had two. And I'd argue yeah. Indiana should not have been in that spot at number four. And, and neither did I. I did not absolutely did not think Indiana should be there. I thought Indiana was it. Let me put it this way. 
Jalen Pickett plays for Indiana, Jalen Pickett is a rock solid first team All American. Okay? Absolutely. I'll just say it, I'll just say it straight out loud. The branding means something to people. I got it. Um, but Arizona's a two, lost to Princeton. Princeton then knocks out Missouri, so they beat a Pac-12 and an SEC. Okay. Uh, but the bottom line is, is that you look at it. Let's see here. Let's go through this very quickly. Maryland met its seed. Okay. They were an eight. They won. Okay. Then they played Alabama one, based on your seed. But it, so one team met its seed. Next, Michigan State. They have exceeded their seed. They're in the Sweet 16. That's two. Purdue did not. Right? For obvious reasons, we, you know, everybody knows that. Uh, next up, Penn State. Did they exceed their seed? Yes. Uh, Indiana. Did they exceed their seed? No. They won their first game, but there are four. Miami's a five. So I'm just talking about the pure seed. You know, I, I just think seeding is just setting up a bracket, but I'm just pointing this out. Uh, next up. I did not know. I did not know. Northwestern. Did they meet their seed? Yeah, that's four. Okay. Did they exceed their seed? No, but as a nine, they would be expected to not win that game, correct? Iowa. Iowa did not meet its seed. But you get five out of the eight teams that were in it. Two exceeded their seeds, three of them met their seeds. Okay. Three didn't. And they only had two teams in the top in the top four seeded spot anyway. You hate this <laughs> all, all, all I'm saying is if you look at the I'm not saying that this game in particular is like the main reason why. I, I think when you look at all those matchups and why each Big Ten team lost to the exception of Penn State. Because I think Penn State's run and Michigan State's run they're currently on now, to me, are the saving grace for the conference because they right. have either adapted or already are at, like Penn State, the way the NCAA, the rest of the NCAA plays right now. Michigan State, well, their is, credit's kind of adjusted. Right. Right. Well, well, Michigan State wants to play that way. They just couldn't play it that way all season. Now they feel like they're free to play yeah, it, right? Because Michigan State's a 39% three-point shooting team. I mean, they are they're, I mean, a big three-point shooting team. But here, here are the conferences in the Sweet 16. SEC, Mountain West, Big East, Ivy. That's Louisville. Hmm. Kansas City, Big East, Big 12, ACC American. Hmm. New York. Big Ten. Big Twelve. Conference USA. SEC. <laughs> this is. And then the West. But the West is the West Coast Conference, the Pac-12, who else is in the West? The SEC, Arkansas, and who else is Arkansas for me? I just don't have any fun. But see, you see how everything like there's no two conferences in any any region. And you've got a conference USA, a Mountain West. Um, a West Coast Conference, an Ivy. I mean, that's 25% of your, of your Sweet 16. It's just how balanced the game is. 
Mike Bray, and you know the great respect I have for Mike Bray. Great respect for me. And I've referenced him many times on this show, the things he has said publicly, the things he has said to Dick or me, along the way. Okay? He always wanted to be, felt that his best chance was to be the older kid. And his best chance for the older kid. Well, guess what's happened between COVID years and transfers? Everybody is now older. It took Mike's advantage away. Everybody's older. And that's the difference you're seeing. I mean, Duke's not older. Didn't make it. Kentucky's not older. Didn't make it. Kansas is eh, kind of a mix, but mostly younger. Didn't make it. North Carolina was older, but I'll be honest with you, North Carolina, except for one six-week stretch last year, has played like this for two years. I mean, what you saw this year is no different than how they played from November to the middle of February in the 21-22 season. No difference. I mean, those are considered to be the blue bloods. Oh, I know, the other ones you got. You know the Big East. Big East has done well. Xavier made it, Creighton made it, UConn made it. Big East has done fine. And UConn's really good, by the way. Really good. UConn can win the West. They can win it. So the Big Ten, I mean, five teams, if five teams win their opening round, so they went five and three. In the next round of the five, they went one and four. And the only one that was that was seeded in such a way to get through was, was actually Indiana. Penn State, Northwestern, Michigan State, you know, based on the seed, we're not supposed to get through. And neither was Maryland. And you had into the next round a 10, an 8, two sevens, and a 4. Well, the only one that was supposed to, quote, get through based on their seed was Indiana. So that was Michigan State. That's just based on the seed. Well, you know, to me, the seed is just down. It just tells you what the path is. Everything's so close. Everybody's a little bit older. And it's just close. And you're right. Penn State style of play, you're seeing it in how Michigan State. That's how you play the game. Right? We, now, having a big guy helps. Because there are certain sets you want to call out of a timeout. Hey, we're in a little bit of a slump like that. So let's take Kansas State. Kansas State kind of plays a wide open game, except for one exception. They got Keontae Johnson. And they kind of out of a timeout. Tang can look around and say, you know what? Okay, I need, we need a bucket here. We're going to stop the run. Let's run a post play for Deontay Johnson. See, that's where the big guy comes into play. And Johnson can step out, face the basket, and shoot. Right. We'll come back. More in a moment. Great to have you with us today on News Radio 1070 WKOK. The number 15 seed, the Princeton Tigers. It's never been sweeter if you're a Princeton fan than right now. 78 to 63, the final. And a number 15 seed continues on. The largest margin of victory by a 15 seed. And as Brendan said, it was really never in doubt. Once they got the lead in the first half, they never relinquished it. Janelle Davis to inbound. Here's Boyd. Five seconds left. Boyd drives. Scores! With 2.5. Lomax at midcourt, McCadden doesn't get it off, and the Owls win it! I don't know what the last one was. That was also Andrew Cowan. He had a great weekend. Oh, he's on a, he's on a court at Atlantic? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that was the game against Memphis. Yeah. 
Roger Goodell and the NFL owners expected to finalize a multi-year contract extension. Be the fourth extension for Goodell. You are a big fan. No God! No God! No God! He's done his job. What's his job? His job is labor, peace, and TV. It may take some work, obviously, and it will be close in terms, but they have a collective bargaining agreement that has 10 years of labor, peace, guarantee. Now, sure, it passed by an average of 32 to 30. And the joke, that's, that was the average for teams, 32 to 30. But a pass. And then a 100 plus billion dollar media rights deal with CBS, NBC, Fox, ESPN, and Amazon. No offense, but whatever extension he gets from the owner, as far as I can see, he earned it. The last team that was sold before Roger Goodell took over as commissioner in 2006 were the Minnesota Vikings. They sold for $600 million. The Denver Broncos sold for $4.5 billion. I mean, if you're the owners, are you saying this guy's done a bad job? I mean, I know you don't like him, but you don't like anybody. <laughs> Just needs to leave well enough alone. No one's ever going to catch up to the league. Don't try to ruin it. But again, what's his job? Labor peace and TV money. Well, it may be a fight on both, especially on the labor peace part, but he's got both. 